Yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> do you regret the decision to retire? Every now and again, yes. Yes, I, yes, I do. But I said it, and uh, now I suppose uh, I've got to do it. But, uh, but off and on I do, yes. It's been a long career, and I, I want to go through whole sections of it. Obviously, we can't cover the whole thing. And I want to start with a curveball, which is when you and John Singleton bought Soul Brothers Circus and you trained to be lion tamers. Tell me about that. I, I trained to be a lion tamer <laughs> because he told me that I was going to have to be the one to go into the lion's ring. And you believed him? I believed him. OK. So I had about 45 minutes training to be a lion <laughs> trainer. <laughs> And then they put me in the cage with the lions. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. But it was rather wonderful. When did you first realise you had such an extraordinary voice? I don't think I have. Excuse me one second. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's impossible. No. I don't, I don't think about it. I, I mean, I love voices and... Uh, I listen... I obviously listen to voices, but I don't think there's anything sort of special about my voice. When you first applied for a job in radio, the station manager said to you your voice wasn't right for radio, didn't he? He said I was too nasal. Were you devastated? No, I, no, I wasn't. Did you go and do something about it? Yes, I went and got a job in radio. <laughs> <laughs> but did you go home and think, oh, I've got to change my voice? I've got to work no, right? no. And I never did. I mean, I, I'm fundamentally lazy when it comes to that kind of discipline. I couldn't have gone and... Uh, done that how now brown cow rubbish. Uh, you know, it was either going to be me as it was or it wasn't going to be at all. I'll get back to some of the techniques of radio in a minute. When you were uh, with the Top 40 radio and, uh, back in the 60s and back in the 50s, you used to take people like uh, Johnny Cash and Roy Orbison and Jerry Lee Lewis out on the town. What was a night on the town like with John Laws? <laughs> I don't know if this is the right place to... <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice genteel audience you have here. But it wasn't so much a night out with John Laws. If it was Johnny Cash, it became a night out with Johnny Cash. He was the star. Mm -hmm. So what sort of things would you get up to with, say, Johnny Cash? This really isn't very funny. It's, it's outrageous. Being in Melbourne with, uh, with Johnny Cash in a well-known hotel, and he decided the room was too small, but he decided that the lobby outside the lift was about the right size to accommodate him and his various guitars and various hangers-on. So we all took all the furniture out of the room and put it in the lobby outside the lift. And then he rang for room service. <laughs> and the poor little waiter came up in the lift and the lift doors open and, and here's the room with all the furniture. You had, I guess, have a reputation as a man that likes a drink. In fact, I think your nickname is the Gargler, is that right? One of them? Yeah, one of them. Mm. But you were smart about it. Uh, a barman called Eddie Tarango, you and he had an arrangement. What was that? Ah, well, that, well sometimes he wouldn't put as much in the glass as people imagined he put in the glass. Mm. That's all. So you'd be out drinking with people and a round of drinks would be served and your first one would be full strength? Oh, yes. Maybe the first few. But then when Eddie saw the writing on the wall, or the floor, <laughs> <laughs> Eddie would back off a little. But everybody else's would stay at full strength? Yes. Yours would be... And they all fell over on the floor. <laughs> And you had stories to tell the next day on the radio. Sure did. Very good. <laughs> John Brennan, who's uh, worked with you in radio yeah. over a lot of your career, he used to talk about how just your skill, a lost skill now because it's all electronic, you used to be able to operate four turntables simultaneously. What was it that you were capable of doing? Oh, I could just set up four records. Uh, one at the beginning, one halfway through, one nearly at the end and one at the end and, and just fly from one to the other by moving my hands quickly. You realise now that that's, in any dance club, that's what DJs do. They mix all these records together. Yeah. Have you thought of that now that you're leaving <laughs> radio? Yes. yes, I have, actually. DJ Can Lawsy. you imagine it? <laughs> I, I, Can you the imagine jewelry? It? I think it'd be great. No. no, I haven't really considered it, but you never know what the future holds. When 2UE switched to Talkback in the 60s, yes. you saw an opportunity there. You felt that the medium wasn't being used as fully as it could be. What were you seeing that other people were missing? I think I was seeing the opportunity to allow people who listen to radio to become part of the radio. 
Uh, and when we started with talk radio, they would ring and make a comment, but it would sound like they were reading it because Australians back then, with the greatest respect to Australians, weren't all that articulate. They weren't used to speaking in public. So in the beginning, it was, it was difficult to, to get the Australian callers to react, to relax. And the way I used to do that in, in the first talk program I did was to be rude to them. And then <laughs> Australians don't like you being rude to them, and why should they? And then they would react. So can you give me an example? Someone calls up and says, hello, John. I want to talk about the government, I don't like it, what would you say? Well, why did you vote for it, idiot? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. But, you know, in the early days, something like that, yeah. You see, what talk radio did was replace the back fence. When my mum... Uh, when we used to live out of Parramatta, when my mum and dad had a small goods shop in Parramatta, she used to spend quite a considerable amount of time talking over the back fence. And then when apartments got built and all these people who used to have a back fence suddenly found they didn't have one, they had nobody to talk to. And talk radio replaced the back fence. And that's why people started to articulate and want to talk and talk about their worries to me instead of the person next door. How did you know then that this would work when the prevailing wisdom was that it shouldn't be done? I didn't know it would work. I've done a lot of things in my life that <laughs> I wasn't sure about doing. You had an instinct, clearly. Yes, I, I, I probably had that. But, but don't overestimate me. I'm no genius. You know, I've had a, as I said to you, I've had a hell of a lot of luck. Uh, I was lucky then. It's more than that, though. I want to play a bit of a call uh, from your show with a, a listener who uh, called herself Cinderella from, oh, yes. from Gadooga. Do you remember Cinderella? Certainly. How could I forget her? Uh, she shopped at Vinnie's. She'd actually stolen something from Vinnie's and was going That's to return right. it. That hers was a, a tough life. Yes, and yeah. uh, you two sort of started... You started flirting with her and romancing her over the phone. I'm going to play this little bit where, over the radio, you invite her to dance. I'm about to twirl you. Yeah. Here you go. I, ca I can't twirl all the time. Right? You're a very forcible dancer. You're leading me now. Man is supposed to lead. It's not the... nice. Why? What? You smell nice. Of course, I smell nice. What what is that do you wear? It's called man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of other people would have let that call go. Would have passed yeah. it off very quickly. Why didn't you? Because they're the calls that humanise you. I mean, you can't sit up there like some tin god being dictatorial to a woman like that. You know, she wants to have a bit of fun and you should let people have fun. They're the best calls. They're easily the best calls. Neville Rand said a great thing about you once. He said, when it comes to abuse, you knew how to play every string on the instrument. We've got another caller here, here that you remember. This is George. George Raymond. My letter. Oh, from Post Office Box 200 Edgecliff. Yes, I've had a change of heart. I don't give a stuff what you've had, you mealy-mouthed old bastard. You wrote me this abusive letter, you wrote me this dreadfully abusive letter, and then you ring up and say you've had a change of heart. I don't care what you've had a change of. Go away. <laughs> ah. Is that all part of the theatre too? Is that how yeah, you see it? Yes. Oh, yes, it is. Because, you, you know, you don't really... People say, oh, how can you be so rude, you're dreadful. But you're not hurting anybody because nobody knows who the person is. What about the person themselves? They know. Yes, but don't they feel hurt? <clears throat> and then after a while they get really worried that they're who they are. <laughs> and ring back. <laughs> Roy and HD said a great thing about you. When they were... When they were devising their act, they'd listened a lot to you and they said, what we noticed with John was that he'd advanced an argument at ten past nine and by ten to twelve he'd be arguing fiercely against it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Is that part of it too, the theory yes. of it? Well, I think it's very important to, to admit that you can be wrong. Uh, and I'm frequently wrong. And I don't see anything wrong with admitting it. If, if, if I start an argument at ten past nine and by ten to ten somebody's convinced me that the argument's facile, then... I'm quite prepared to say, well, hang on, you're probably right. Maybe I got off on the wrong foot here. I don't see anything wrong with that. When have you been wrong, John? Ah, I'm often wrong. 
but uh, I'm wrong so often, don't ask for specifics, but, but quite often I get angry with somebody or quite often I forget to tell Caroline I love her or I walk out of the house in a hurry when she's done nothing wrong, then I'm wrong. Sometimes I'm short-tempered with my children, uh, then I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm often wrong. When I want to talk about some more tricks of the trade. Uh, this thing you did, and I know that... You want my job. You want to learn how, all, all the stuff I do. That's a, this is not a television program. This, An audition. This whole, this whole thing is a fake to get all this information out of me. My very, very good friend, John Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> oh, shut up. The idea of the oracle whereby, again, clever show business, somebody would ring up and ask a question and by the time that question got to you on air, the information, the answer was on the screen. Uh, was, was that something you pioneered? Yes. If it needed to be, hmm. it didn't always need to be. Give a man a chance, Andrew. I did know something. Oh, yes, no, I'm aware of that. But I've heard, for instance, somebody call up from, say, Tumut and um, you'll say, oh, how, and how is so-and-so the butcher from Tumut? Yeah. Now, you may know all the butchers in Australia, but I, I, I doubt it. And I, it. No, the only one I know is in Tumut. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of your image, starting with the poetry. Yes. I've got a little bit here to remind some people. Uh, this is... I you just... will have picked out the crappiest bit of poetry you can lay hands on. No, I didn't. I didn't pick out my favourite, which you may remember is my favourite. My genes still hug me. I Why wish don't you, you? you... No, I wish you did. Oh. Not you, but... No, you. I understand. Now, this is... This, no, this is actually... Here it is. The muffins got stuck today. I didn't write that. <laughs> you didn't write the muffins got stuck today? I did not. I never know the difference between muffins and crumpets, but they would have stuck anyway and I love you. Oh, stuck. Stuck? What did you think I, I said? I thought you said sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about sucking crumpets. I can tell you. <laughs> not, not a thing. Nothing. Now, I read an interview where you said... Being an angry, dark young man was a good look in the 60s and we sold heaps of poetry books. Were you a businessman or a beatnik? Both. Both. I mean, I knew what it was about. My friend Rod McEwen was selling poetry all over the world and in Australia. And I simply copied the style of books that he did, even to the size of. I was the biggest selling poet in Australia for about a period of three years. But ask how many people in the audience ever bought a poetry book and you'll realise it wasn't very hard to be the biggest seller of poetry <laughs> in, in Australia. Les Murray's on the phone right now. Yeah. That's not true! <laughs> Did you spend a lot of time writing poetry? Or... No, not really. On aeroplanes and in bars, maybe. And if I could make myself feel... It, I wrote some of the best stuff between marriages. It's always a good time to write... <laughs> write uh, poetry. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd convinced myself that I'd been hardly done by and I was a broken-hearted man and write all that stuff. The other part of your image, of course, was uh, the trucks, the trucking. Yeah. Um, I've actually got something to show you, which is kind of your country and western roots. This is from Bandstand uh, back in the mid-60s. Oh, the buzzing of the bees and the cigarette trees, the soda water fountain, where the lemonade springs and the bluebird sings in the big rock candy mountain. 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 Look at little Judy. Little Judy Stone. She's so adorable. What was the country and western thing with you? I just loved it. I just liked the music. Liked the sound of the music and I could play a guitar. And Colin and I used to sit, Col Joy and I used to sit around together and we used to go down to Smoky Dawson's Ranch in French's Forest on Saturday afternoons and sing, ride horses. It was just a thing I went through. I think we all go through stages like pimples. Well, there's also the, the, trucking, the trucking albums. I found this one. Uh, you've <laughs> never been trucked like this before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's subtle too, wasn't it, that title? Yeah, what is that one driving at? <laughs> Is this just an informal shot of you in a, at a lunchtime? I'm... I, I, no, I think it was daylight saving and it was sort of early evening. <laughs> was this your own personal truck? No. It's got your name on the side. Yeah. We paid the man to do that, yes. Did you have a stretched truck of your own? No. I used to drive them, but I 
No, I never owned one. I was never rich enough to own a truck. <laughs> I have to remind you, people will see this interview. That's <laughs> uh, what I keep forgetting. Uh -huh. So what was it with you and trucks? Why the, the, the love affair between you and trucks and truckies? Well, I, I, I loved the country, uh, and I loved the big open country of central Queensland, particularly, where I used to spend a lot of time, uh, in wool sheds, being a roustabout in wool sheds, and uh, working as a fencer. And I just used to watch those big trucks go by, those road trains, as they called them, and they intrigued me. The thing about your voice, going back to your voice and your ability to sell, within the industry, the view that the reason you were such an accomplished salesman is that you were believable, what you were saying before, that your audience identified with you above and beyond the fact that they were getting a message, that they believed you when you spoke. Now, you're very proud of your skill as a salesman, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Come on, you've got to get me in that. You're not going to do the death out of me. Last time, last time we did an interview, he said, you're very good at reading commercials, could you just read this one? And he'd, and he'd written a commercial about death. Now, now, the point there was, it was my view that you could sell anything. Now, that was... <laughs> that was ten years ago, and as it turns out... I've written an ad. Now, this is a test of the, the law's technique. This is a cold read, which means you're not going to get a chance to pre-read it. Uh, it's, oh. it's for a meat product, uh, one of my favourite sorts of meat, tongue. <laughs> Are you ready to go? I've written it for your voice. 30 seconds. John Laws, go. When I want the best in life, I look no further than Alan Jones' tongue. <laughs> Perfect for every occasion, Alan Jones' tongue brings a smile to my face. <laughs> every time. The Prime Minister loves Alan Jones' tongue, I love it and so will you. It can be found everywhere and is surprisingly cheap. When it comes to tongue, make no bones, make it Alan Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd bring Alan up. I knew you would. I didn't know you'd do it in such a clever, subtle way. <laughs> what I like about that is that's on the record now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. They're going to be playing that in 2GB tomorrow morning. <laughs> I've got to tell you at this stage, I don't mind what's on the record. OK. Let's go on the record. All right. Haven't we been on the record? We or? have been on the record, but I want to talk about power. All right. OK. Bob Kai used to say that going on your show humanised politicians. Yeah. Which of the Prime Ministers that you've met, and you've met nine of them, did you genuinely like? Oh, I genuinely liked uh, Paul Keating. Very hard not to like him. Might not like his politics, and I certainly didn't like a lot of them. But, it, but I liked him very much. He, he was a very, very... And he is a very amusing man. Uh, and a great joke teller. Billy McMahon was uh, a terrific character. A terrific character. A character? Yeah. In what way a character? He was infuriating. <laughs> I can remember on one occasion he rang me up at three in the morning uh, when we lived fairly close to each other in the eastern suburbs. And uh, I, don't, I don't think Bill drank to excess. And whether he had this night or not, I don't know. But he said, you'll have to do something about it. And I said, what? And he said, He's taken it away. I said, what, what, Bill? What's he taken away? He said, Whitlam. He's taken my car away. <laughs> and I said, Bill, I can't do anything about that. And Bill had the, used to drive around this huge Daimler that was... A, and you could hardly see Billy in it. <laughs> you know, little head pop-up sort of... And, but he was mad about the car and he was furious that, that, uh, that Goff had taken it away. And he thought that you could change Goff's He thought car? that I should talk to Goff. I might as well have had it talk to that carpenter's talk to Goff. <laughs> and what about Goff? What kind of a man was he? He's a very, very amusing man. Uh, he's got a wonderful wit. And I think, he, I think his intentions were honourable when, uh, when he became Prime Minister. I think that he had a, a serious social agenda. I think he really cared about people who weren't doing as well as uh, some others. But it didn't seem to work. He seemed to come a bit unstuck there. 
Did you, as you saw these men in their private moments, did, yes. did you detect insecurities that you didn't expect? Did you see difference between public and private? Yes, I'll tell you, I noticed it, I noticed it the other day and it, it, it intrigued me. I was um, going to do an interview with Kevin Rudd and uh, I was going to pre-record it at half past seven in the morning because he was going to Perth in an aeroplane or something. I said, is that you, Kevin? He said, yes, John, how are you? And I said, good. How are you? I bet you're a bit tired. He said, oh, he said, tired? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard work. And I said, well, I imagine it is, but the end result, if you achieve it, surely it'll be worth the effort. He said, oh, yes, he said, but sometimes, you know, it's just so damn hard. And then he stopped, and obviously uh, one of his people said to him, that's being recorded. And there was a hesitation, and he came back to me and said, uh, are, you, are, you, are we recording? And I said, yeah. He said, but I, I was just talking to you. And I said, well, that's the idea of the interview. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, my people would rather you didn't play that. Now, he'd behaved in quite a normal, pleasant fashion. Mm. I mean, I, I know him. I've had lunch with him on more than one occasion, and I know his wife and lunch with her. Uh, so it's not as if we're not good acquaintances, but he was terrified that he should appear to be natural, which, which really surprised me. I would have thought it would have done him a tremendous amount of good to sound like just a normal, everyday bloke. And then when I said, all right, well, if you want to do it, we'll start it again, he sounded like a totally different man. Do you uh, have some sympathy for Peter Garrett because he's just been... No, I have no sympathy for Peter Garrett. <laughs> Hasn't he just been caught out doing that same thing? Uh, no, because he, he did it knowingly in front of a group of people, apparently, and, and then redid it. No, I have no sympathy for Peter Garrett. I think Peter Garrett's radical. Bob Hawke... Uh, came on your show once and did this most amazing suck job. It was extraordinary. He was Prime Minister and he, it was this speech along the lines of no Prime Minister, no government has worked harder to seek the benefit, the wisdom of John Law's listeners because John Law's listeners are Australia. Why was he sucking so hard? <laughs> Probably because he was in trouble. I mean, people... <laughs> I'm aware, I'm very well aware of the fact that I get used. And I do, you know, these... A lot of politicians will make it sound as though I'm their best friend, but as soon as I'm no use to them anymore, they rarely appear in my life again. Uh, so I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I get used, but I suppose conversely I use them a bit, so what's it matter? Who was the best of them in terms of the challenge for you as an interviewer? Oh, probably Paul Keating, because he's got a mind like a steel trap. You and he got on extremely well, didn't yeah. you? And, and you used to socialise together. He, yeah. he would come to the, your farm and he and Anita. Why was it that you two were so compatible? I, I don't know. You'd have to ask him about uh, his, uh, his liking for me. My liking for him was, was his, uh, his brain, and, uh, which is like a sponge. He'd just absorb knowledge. And... Uh, his, his humour, when he, when he was relaxed, he was very, very funny. It could be very funny and tell terrific jokes. And I thought that he had a genuine passion, even though, as I say, all, all his politics I certainly didn't feel comfortable with, but he had a genuine passion for Australia too. I'm putting on the spot a bit here, but can you give an example of the Keating humour? No, no, not here. <laughs> Why is that, John? What's wrong with this particular group of people? All right, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a poor kidding joke. There was a man who used to continually go and see his doctor with all sorts of ridiculous complaints that didn't exist. And after a while, the doctor realised that he was going because he had eyes for the doctor's receptionist, who happened to be a particularly buxom, beautiful blonde. And one day, the doctor said, well, look, I've got some... Uh, news for you, you have got a problem. You've got a legitimate and serious illness. What do you want first, the good news or the bad news? And the fellow said, well, the bad news. He said, well, I think you've probably got about three months to live. He said, what's the good news? And the doctor said, you know the receptionist, the blonde with the bosom? I said, yeah, yeah. And the doctor said, I'm bonking her. And that's a Paul Keating joke, is it? That's a Paul Keating joke. <laughs>
If he'd have just told that in an election campaign, I think he might have been re-elected. Yeah, it could have been easy. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was a good joke teller. They did cultivate you, and Keating, Keating famously said, if you can educate John Laws, you can educate Middle Australia. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the occasion Keating took you down to the Reserve Bank. Oh, we were having lunch one day, and we were talking about uh, monetary matters. And one phone call to my accountant will indicate to you that I know nothing about monetary matters. And he was talking in this convoluted language, which I simply couldn't absorb. Uh, I mean, it was beyond me. So he said, look, there's only one way to resolve this. I'll take you down to the Reserve Bank and we'll have a meeting with the directors and they can explain it all to you. He made two or three phone calls, car arrived, and he took me to the Reserve Bank. And the next thing I knew, I was in the boardroom of the Reserve Bank with these highly intelligent men <laughs> trying to explain to me what the monetary policy was all about. And? I still don't know. <laughs> You said before that these friendships don't last. No. Have any of them? Not really. No, not really. Not Keating? No. I haven't seen him for ages. He sends me fond messages all the time, but I haven't... Uh, I wouldn't have seen him socially once since he was, uh, since he was tossed out. But I said to you before, w I get used. Is that disappointing for you, that uh, he was a man you no. admired, whose company you enjoyed, that it was just about being used? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, anybody would be uh, slightly disappointed, but, but once I woke up to the fact that that was the way they played the game, it's a completely different political game. So I, I accept that. Can you ever imagine yourself in that career, politics? No. No. The cars aren't as good. <coughs> no. But, no. But you've... you've You've either got to be a, a hypocrite or a liar to be a good politician, preferably both. <laughs> Who's best at it? Oh, there are a few good ones down there. But, I mean, if you, if you join a party, you have to subscribe to, to their way of thinking, even if you don't agree with it. So you're being hypocritical, aren't you? And if you say you agree with it, then you're lying. And I, don't like, I wouldn't like to have to live my life like that. You once uh, said on air uh, to John Howard, broadcasting not directly to his face, he'd gone on someone else's show and, and you accused him of being a little groveller and you said, screw you, go on someone else's show. I did. Is it a nice thought to know that you can say that to the Prime Minister, realising that he's going to come on your show again anyway? I, I've got to say, I felt a bit bad about saying it. I was very angry. and You're not supposed to say things like that to the Prime Minister. But I, but I was very angry. Uh, I later apologised to him. For saying it, and I shouldn't have said it, but you make mistakes, and, uh, and of course I didn't think, I didn't say it knowing that he would reappear on my program. Over the course of your career, you managed to elicit some comments from politicians which were major news. Paul Keating's Banana Republic, probably yeah. the most famous. John Howard on Asian immigration, which set his career back many years. Yeah. It took a long time to live down. You are not a journalist by trade, you call yourself a disc jockey. How were you able to get those sort of things out of seasoned politicians? Uh, well, that'd be telling. <laughs> but, uh, I, th I think the time is right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, uh, first of all, you make them feel comfortable. And then you ask what sounds to be a rather naive question. And consequently, you get an answer. You don't get it by attacking people. And I see no sense in being deliberately confrontational. And was it a clear goal for you to, to elicit those kind of remarks? Is that the aim? Yes, I, you've got to. It's, uh, you, know, you get a headline. And that's the point. And you need the headlines. So when Paul Keating goes, well, we'll end up as a banana republic, inwardly you're going, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Many commentators, many political commentators, have dismissed you as just a disc jockey. Did it help to be underestimated in that way? Didn't do any harm. But I'm not... I'm, I never really overly concern myself about what other people in the same industry think about me. Would you have liked more respect? I don't know. Don't I have respect? You know what I mean. You know what I mean. There we go again. You know that you were... Often that phrase is used about you, well, he's just a disc jockey. Oh, yes. Well, that's, I mean, that's sort of uh, 
a bitter journalist's excuse for his own inadequacy. They call me a disc jockey to offend me. Uh, and I'm not about to allow some second-rate journalist who's never going to write Gone with the Wind or War and Peace uh, to upset me. Keating listed you as amongst Australia's 20 most powerful people. And in that he meant you knew how things worked and you knew how to make them work. In your view, where does real power lie in Australia? Well, it, with sections of the media. But I, I, I think it's very wrong to underestimate the Australian public. I don't think Australians are gullible. I think Australians are pretty smart people when it comes to making decisions about politics and the future of their own country. Sure, but where do you think power lies? Probably in the media. In the media. And that would be obviously Rupert Murdoch, but that would also be broadcasters such as yourself and Alan Jones. Where else? The press. Uh, yeah, the press. I don't know that, that, that broadcasters like uh, me and Alan have, uh, have a, a lot of influence. I really don't. I think that you know, by the next day we're talking about something else. People have probably forgotten what we said the day before. There might be a slight lasting effect, but I don't have any delusions about that. Maybe However, there's does. a reason that Prime Ministers would want to come on your show, would yes. want to come on your show. Yeah. That's surely more than just ego. There is direct influence and influences. Well, they, they believe so, and that's fine. But and it's their they... business to know so, isn't it? They know yeah, who well, they, they need well, to they, yes. yeah. well, they believe so. I don't know that they're all that smart, are they? You, you strike me as disingenuous on this. I can't believe that you don't understand the power that your position holds. Oh, I understand the, I understand the power it could have. I'm not being disingenuous. Yeah. It's not a tray that I suffer gladly in anybody, including me. So I'm not being disingenuous. I'm simply saying that I, I, think, I think the power might be exaggerated. Because if, particularly if you know that a broadcaster has got an axe to grind, particularly if you know... Now, hopefully, nobody knows what I vote, because I don't tell anybody, and I try to remain totally informal and uh, impartial when it comes to politics, so I hope nobody knows what I vote. If I give an even run to Rudd as, and to Howard and, and uh, I am as critical of, of uh, the Howard ministers as I am of the opposition, I think the public accept that. Your biographer, John Lyons, um, you said to him, yeah, look, I'm a racist and that's, I have that in common with most Australians. Yeah. Uh, why do you think most Australians are like that? Because I think one of the reasons they like it is because we've been so isolated if you live in Europe, you're going to see Italians all the time if you happen to be in France or vice versa, or Germans or Austrians or Russians or whatever, because it's one big melting pot and it's all close together. Here we were so removed from the rest of the world, we just weren't accustomed to seeing people of different colours or different accents or different backgrounds. But I think we're getting over that. So when you have, as you have occasionally, and fairly recently, when you have a pop at Asian drivers... Yes. Is that partly because you believe it and partly because you know it plays with your audience? No, it's got nothing to do with en anything more than I believe it. And I still believe it, and I've been castigated for saying it, but I'm sure we've had many calls from many Asians who agree. I just don't think Asian people drive motor cars very well. I don't know what the reason is, but that's my opinion. Is racism a trade within yourself, self-admitted, that you would like to get out of your... I don't makeup? know that it's a... I don't know that it's a... a it's a lack of understanding. And, yes, obviously, I'd like to be more understanding of, of people. Yeah. We should all try and be more understanding of other people. I think we need to get you an Asian chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably become very fond of him. And Should he'd probably... probably be very happy sitting in the back there. Another part of your legend is, is the handmaidens and, and that you, in your office, you insist that women only wear dresses, not pants. Yeah. Is that about old-fashioned chauvinism or is that about power? No, no, it's just... It's probably old-fashioned chauvinism. But I, it, it's been probably one of, the, one of the severest maladies I've suffered in my life, a, a love for women. And I like women to look like women. 
And I think that when they're wearing dresses and maybe high heel shoes, which they do frequently, they look very feminine. And I love very feminine women. You've talked about with marriage, you're on your th this is your third marriage, and that it's taken you to the third marriage to respect the institution. Yes. How were you with the first two? What kind of a man? Oh, pretty awful, I think. Uh, I did many things that, that I now regret doing. I unwittingly hurt people I shouldn't have hurt. I've never really deliberately tried to hurt anybody, and I hope I never do deliberately. But through stupidity and selfishness, and I've certainly been selfish, I obviously hurt people that I, that I shouldn't have hurt. And I was, I was not a good husband, uh, and I have no excuses. What are you like when you're selfish? That, that what I'm like now. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just a selfish person, I imagine, because I've been pretty much spoiled in my life, uh, at least in the latter part of my life. And if you're spoiled, you tend to be selfish. Were you, in those early marriages, would you describe yourself as an aggressive man? Oh, no. Vocally, yes, but physically, never. No, no, no. Hmm. But capable of hurting someone vocally? Yes. I mean, I've got a very sharp tongue that I uh, use incorrectly sometimes. Arrogant? Uh, I don't know about arrogant. People... people uh, I think want to perceive me as uh, arrogant. You know, quite often shyness can be misconstrued as arrogance. I really am quite a shy person. I don't like walking into restaurants by myself. Or I just keep pretty much to myself. It is interesting because over the years I, I know you've had things like shingles and various nervous conditions and you're known amongst your friends as very insecure. Why do you struggle with that? Well, uh, uh, quite often I probably think that I don't quite deserve what I have. But I feel insecure about it because uh, you can't do anything about it. I mean, I get paid a, what is a ridiculous amount of money, and I'm the first to admit that, but you can hardly give it back. I mean, you'd be stupid if you did, because by accepting it, it helps raise the bar for everybody else who's in, in your industry. But You could raise the bar in terms of altruism, giving it away. Well, I didn't say I don't give it away. But you can make yourself feel so much better by giving most of it away. How do you know I don't? I'm thinking of your cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about the insecurity thing, mm. I suppose. I've always been just a bit insecure. But I do think it keeps you on your toes. So, over all these years, what's driven you? A desire to be accepted probably more than anything. That probably drove me from when I was about eight years old. Do you feel accepted in the way that you would like to? Yes. I'm, I'm very, yes, I'm very happy with, with uh, my lot. I've got lovely friends. I've got a terrific family, very, very interesting family that keeps me on my toes. Uh, and a wonderful job that I'm, I'm going to stop doing shortly. Yes, I feel pretty comfortable with, with, uh, with my life. Because you, your friends and your family and you have talked about your dark moods over the years. Yes. Which have been very intense on occasion. Yes. Why are you unhappy when you're unhappy? I don't know. Ask anybody who gets depressed. They don't know. I don't know. Some mornings I get so depressed I can't get out of bed. I ring up and say I've got a headache. I haven't got a headache. I just am so down I can't, can't get out of bed. But you've got to fight it. And it's a very difficult thing to fight and it's a very difficult thing to explain because you look at yourself in, and even in, in a depressed state you lie in bed and you think, well, I've got Caroline, I've got kids who in the main are pretty good. They do things that have upset you at times, but what kids don't? And I've got sufficient money and what have I got to be depressed about? You just don't know why you're depressed. And I bet there are plenty of people in the audience who maybe they don't want to admit it, but they have days of feeling... Worse than other days, you just have ups and downs, but with somebody who is, is manically depressed, the pendulum swings further. And would you describe yourself as manically depressed? <sighs> On occasions. Were there times where you almost looked at yourself in the third person, looked at John Laws and thought, I just don't like John Laws? Yes. And what didn't you like? But, uh, probably the way I was, I was living my life. I think, it, I think it's quite important for 
everybody to, to remove themselves from themselves and look back. I think it's very important to do it, because uh, otherwise you can't be self-analytical and you've got to be on occasions, otherwise you don't, uh, you don't admit your own frailties. And it does, it does make you change, it made me change. In what way? Oh, from being a you know, raving womaniser <laughs> and drinking too much and partying too much and not caring about my family enough. I'll ask you a bit about your family in a second. Just the womanising, yes, you had, a, you had a real reputation for that. Yeah. Did it just come with the territory of being successful and powerful? Is that how it was? Uh, I, I can't answer that because I've not known any other territory, I suppose. So I don't know. I just, you know, I, I loved women and I loved their company and I liked being in their company. I always respected them and always will, but I never had... I mean, I fell in love with Caroline when Caroline was 14. Uh, and then she went to London and did ballet dancing and then married and left the country and there was a 20-year gap where I, where I didn't see her. But as soon as she came back into my life, that was it. That was, she was the woman and we've, uh, we've been together ever since. Well, was she the unrequited love you were always yeah. carrying? So when you actually did get together again many years later, that must have been a very powerful thing. Extraordinary it was. It was just wonderful. And it's been wonderful ever since. I'm happy to be able to say. I've curbed my ways and I'm well behaved. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I promise. You've got uh, five of your own kids, four stepdaughters. How good a dad have you been? Uh, improved dramatically in the last 30 years. Before that, I would think uh, worse than lousy. Not good. I've tried to make up for it. And they all say I have. I mean, I have great love from, from my children. And we have a great closeness, even, even the girls. We're, we're tremendously close. It's been 55 years coming to a close. For decades, you were the only person in Australian radio who could make or break a radio station yeah. by taking audiences with you. Now, as you reach the end of your career, in the biggest market in Australia, you've got something like half the audience of the market leader. You're, you're rated fifth. Where do you think your audience went? I don't really know. I, th I think that uh, you can outstay your welcome. I think people just get, get uh, tired and bored. And 55 years is a long time to be doing what I've been doing. And uh, maybe people just got tired. That's why, that's why uh, I'm giving it up, you know. I, I feel I outstayed my welcome probably by about five years. How much do you think Cash for Comments played into that sense of people being over you? It probably didn't do a lot of good, but it was, it was one of the most unjust periods of time that I've ever known in my life. And the first question that I was asked in that hearing was, do you give preferential treatment to your sponsors? To which I said, yes, of course I do, which really shocked the whole place because they didn't understand but if somebody is paying me of course I want to look after them I have a responsibility to look after them they're paying they're paying me money it this really interests me because as somebody that's both worked within the industry and has watched your career for many years I don't get what you don't get about cash for comments and I guess the thing that drives at the heart of it is the banking one because it's, it's not really so much about codes or practices, it's more about values, I suppose. And for years you had been very public on air about... But being critical of banks. Yes, the Scrooge, <clears throat> the Uncle Scrooge behind the counter, their fees, closing branches, the stuff that really affected yeah, your true. listeners. So when the scheme was put to you, you know, the, the Australian no, no, Bankers no. Association... The, the scheme wasn't put to me. OK, when it came to I your... I put the scheme to them. You put the scheme to them? Yes. Because their memo showed that what they wanted to do was to pay you, according to their memo, to reduce the negative comments from four to zero a week yeah, well. and increase the positive comments above and beyond the paid endorsements. Yeah. And for that, you're going to get half a million dollars a yeah. year. Well, that memo was incorrect. Uh, a contract was signed between me and the banks mm. that I would promote the banks. It was my suggestion to the banks. I said to them, look, you're, you're in real trouble. All we say about you is horrible things. Don't you think it's time we found some positives? Uh, and it, it then 
worked from then, but it was always a straightforward commercial arrangement. They paid for every uh, commercial or comment I made on radio. They were paying for it. In addition to paying me, which I'm entitled to be paid for what I do, they were also paying the radio station. I don't want to hang your whole career off this, but this was a big moment in your career. It's hard to escape the conclusion from outside that you were just greedy. Well, I, I, pr I probably am. I don't know. That's for other people to judge. Maybe I am greedy. I, it's not something that I've ever thought of myself. I would like to think that I was more on the, leaning towards the generous side than being greedy, but uh, I might be greedy. You were being paid, the station was being paid. It's interesting, at the height of it all, you read out a fax from a listener which said, John, you're nothing but a cheap whore, to which you replied, I'm not cheap, which is a great line. Yeah, <laughs> terrific line. Were you more offended by being thought of than cheap than being perceived as a whore? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't no, Neither thing particularly bothered me. I'm used to criticism, Andrew. I get plenty of it. What do you perceive as your ethics? My conscience. And is your conscience clear on cash for comments? There wasn't cash for comment. On what is known as cash for comment? Well, what is known as cash for comment was a furphy, wasn't it? Because there wasn't cash for comment. Nobody received cash. The comments weren't comments. They were commercials. And it was a legitimate commercial arrangement. Would you wind back any of your actions? No. No. I might, I might have handled them slightly differently had I known of the naivety of some of the people involved with radio broadcasting. Yes. Naivety is probably the wrong word. Stupidity is probably better. You're going to do your last show very soon. Yeah. Are you dreading it? Yeah. Yes, I am. It'll be, uh, I mean, 55 years it's been my life. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm dreading it. When you go home after your last show, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? I don't know. I, I don't know. You mean that day, that very day? No, with your life, with your time. Oh, well, I'll do more travelling. And, I, I'm, uh, and I'm going to write. Uh, I, and I might do some commercial writing as well as uh, a biographical piece. Uh, I've been invited to write. So I'll certainly do that. Is it going to fill the gap, though? Radio, as you say, has been your life. It probably won't fill the gap. And I'll probably, I'll probably be very unhappy off and on, when, because I'll miss it. And now, sometimes, I, I go to bed at night and I think, what the hell did I say I'd stop for? But I still think it's a good idea if I do. You said a few years ago that you think that's why some people die, because they cease to have a reason for living. Yes. Are you a little bit scared of what lies ahead? Uh, yes. I believe that people have got to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And uh, I'm a little bit scared that if I, if I don't have a reason, I won't get out of bed. But I'm sure that Caroline will take care of that. And I'll find things to do and maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do some more television or something. I might do something. You're going to write more poetry? No, never. <laughs> I don't need to now. I'm not between marriages. But if you keep, <laughs> you keep asking these questions about my love life, I will be. Well, if nothing else, you have a future flogging Alan Jones' tongue. John Lewis, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Hiya, George. Hello, John. Fred, the stage manager, told me to tell you it's time. It's time? Well, that's, that's great, George. Let's go now, huh? No, John. Time for a commercial. Oh. Tell me, have you got anything on tonight? Yes, and I'm going to keep it on, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be right back in a minute. Right now, I have to explain to George how to succeed in show business without really trying. Come on, George, my dear. Tomorrow, join Foreign Correspondent with a special investigation into Norwegian Jihad, as well as a...